All right. We've got only one new pull request that I saw, although I was kind of rushing through stuff this morning, so I may have missed stuff, but um, not, not a whole lot of new things. Um, and this one is a very specific crypto thing. Sage, did you look at that at all? No, I'm just looking at it now. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff that closed though. Lots of Niha's stuff for running tests, nightly tests. So she's she yeah. looks like she's making really good progress. Yep. Yeah. Um, let's see some pews changes. Um, the O stream thing. Oh yes, good. That finally merged. Cool. Yeah. And cron tabs. Um, there's this async lock thing, which is kind of encouraging. Um, it's just moving the put message basically outside of the mutex critical section, using lock contention a little bit. And the recovery optimization, that's a big one that is failing sort of spectacularly in QA, right? That still needs more work, Josh. Yeah, exactly. All right, and then there's the QAT one, which like keeps coming up. This one has been in line in flight for a long time. It'd be great to get it in. I don't know how much progress they're making. But anyway. Um let's see. There's a blue FS huge page huge pages for the right buffer. That sounds good. Also it doesn't look like it builds. Um, oh, there's something that fixes the H object T comparator to be less inefficient when it, because um, the key, the effective key is the thing that you sort on, which might be the key or it might be the name. And so basically we were looking at the name three times, um, but that's fixed for the common case. Um, some fixing ref counting, that looks, Really trivial fix, easy to merge. Um, thing on RGW is adding the ability to list bucket context in unsorted order, um, which means that you can walk across a single shard and then walk across the next shard and so on instead of walking across all shards in parallel. Um, that's still in progress. It's sort of a something that. Um, S3 API requires, but most users don't actually need. Um, so having sort of a more efficient listing option for HW, if the application can tolerate it, would be good. Um, let's see, discard. There's some issues with that. Also, the performance. I think the issue with discard is that the um, we added the synchronous discard code already, but when you turn it on, everything goes slower. Um, which is sort of not surprising given how like crummy the discard implementations on SSD seem to be. So it's sort of annoying. Um, what else? There's some hashing changes from Adam. I'm not sure what the current status of those is. That's from Adam Kripchek. That's about it. All this other stuff is pretty old. Outstanding IO throttler, throttler is still the big thing that we need for one of the main things we need for the QS stuff to really work. Um, yep, I think that's it. So a bunch of micro changes here that are pretty simple that we can merge and fly backport like the comparator stuff. All right. All right, Sage, do you want to talk about PG log out of OMAP from yesterday? Kind of. I kind of actually want to table it. Um, the main thing is that this is a this is a big change. Tons of code. Well, not maybe not tons of code, but a 
modest amount of code just to do a proof of concept to look at what the performance would be like. And then assuming that looks good, then we have to like do even more rewriting to do compatibility with the old and the new way and blah, blah, whatever, tons of work. Um, and last I heard the sort of the, um, the upper bound on the benefit that we can get from this, from just like commenting out, setting the OMAP and not writing the PG logs at all was like tiny. So it's, I'm wondering if this is worth pursuing at all. At least now. I thought we didn't have I, measurements for exactly what the, the difference would be with Blue Store, but that it would avoid a lot of uh, Rocks TV rates and therefore ray amplification. I, I don't think you can Maybe. put a single performance number on it, right? Because it depends entirely on. I mean, we, we know it reduces CPU usage pretty dramatically in really, really fast cases. So, Do we? you know, so I still want to, well, I still want to see the current master with the OMAP stuff just turned off. So we're just not writing the OMAP, mm -hmm. but we're still accumulating the thing in memory and then just look at what the Delta is. Cause that's an upper bound basically on what we're going to get. Right. We're not writing it to a new place. We're just not writing it in the old place. We'll get no compaction, additional compaction overhead in RocksDB. So, so that statement is specific to the pet store, but that's what we're doing in the Ceph code itself, right? When, when the, the object store really is kind of, you know, very, very fast, then, then we see a dramatic reduction in CPU usage just in our own code by not doing log operation. By not doing, you're talking about pet store? Well, you know, log operation is OSD, right? So I thought there was a, um, I thought there was a test that you did like six months ago where you just commented out, you just yes. disabled the OMAP rights and yes. there wasn't a very big difference. In IOPS, there was not a huge difference, but those tests, I did not look at the CPU usage. I probably still have the data around somewhere from that, those runs, but, um, but we know that if you just kind of ignore all of that, right, that the OSD itself is doing less work when log operation is is not there. Yeah. And that was pet store again that you did six months ago, right? Not blue store. Blue store. No, that blue store was six months ago. Pet store was like two months ago. All right. And the 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 blue store tests were very specifically looking at what kind of um, key in rate changes we saw by by kind of getting dupe ops out of the picture and uh -huh. you know kind of just like hacking away at stuff the pet store tests were more looking at okay when we start taking these things out of the picture with kind of a, a back end that doesn't do nearly as much crazy stuff as rocks db does then what do we actually see happen and yeah. performance does okay. go up some but the cpu usage is what really goes down I, I, it still feels like we need to repeat the the test from six months ago where you sure. just stop writing on map because that's that's eventually going to get replaced with write it somewhere else um but just not even writing it just remove it and then see what the change is yeah that has to be significant um because if it's like less than five percent then like i think that we have bigger fish to fry i think it's really going to depend on whether or not the behavior that we invoke in RocksDB is a bottleneck overall, right? And that depends on the hardware, both the CPU and the, the device that you're on. You know, if you've got unlimited CPU, maybe recalculating the bloom filters constantly because you've got all these extra keys coming in doesn't matter. But is, but is that the, when we say OMAP, we mean the key, the key value to be, right? I mean, but, but as well, doesn't, doesn't that have logarithmic complexity in some bigger sense so that mixing that together um, it's logarithmic complexity in the size of the write buffer roughly like that's where the cpu gets burned and our write buffers are big because otherwise you push more stuff to l1 just sort of like factor two complexity i guess I don't know. Yeah, it's it's like there are a million variables, <laughs> but it, it yeah. seems like until we can show that the like the best case scenario win is good, then 
it's like it feels like a big distraction. Also, did you turn off um, OMAP rights entirely, or did you specifically filter out? Um, just uh, the PG log, right? Yeah, just the PG log ones. I think it was just the code in the OSD that writes the PG log. So I'd be curious to see how, how how PG log fights with the rest of them. Well, I mean, it's it, so when you it's specific to RocksDB, the, the the big thing is right that when you have lots of data coming into the write ahead log, you're less likely to encounter a tombstone fast enough to be able to get rid of something before it goes into level zero, right? So, Mark. kind of your 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 goal is to write is right is that you don't want the extra write amp. For for short-lived keys, that's in my mind. That's really the goal here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's, it's not just write amp, right? It's it's that you're now also having RocksDB do a lot of extra work for things that don't matter, like recomputing Bloom filters and um, you know doing other things on keys that aren't that none of this is going to matter for. So that's that's kind of the, in my mind, the the kind of craziness here. But can we just do that test, and so we have more information, and then discuss it? Yeah, I I mean that's I guess after it feels minute, like right? this is all speculation <laughs> until we until we. Well, have. It's a certain level that you know, I'll have to take kind of take part of this part of this the table a number of different times. The complexity, I mean, and maybe I mis misunderstanding the, the current framing, but but the but the the duplicate op detection is some, it just doesn't need to be treated the same way as long term data, and so com confusing those time domains is a fun is fun doesn't feel fundamentally correct. Mm -hmm. Sage, I, I got the impression that that Lisa's presentation from from Cephalocon was very convincing that maybe I'm maybe I'm not that's what I, right about that's that. That's what I heard too, but I didn't um I didn't see it. <laughs> I didn't get to see pretty much any of the sessions. So. Recordings are live now, so we can go back and watch them. But, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was uh, pretty convincing that she was unable to get the data to stay out of level zero at all, um, even with an, a wide variety of Rocks TV shootings. I think but the, the question still remains how much of a benefit is it to avoid that? Right? For yeah. different workloads. So if we could run that kind of test with like a OMAP heavy write workload, like RPW bucket index is kind of an, uh, an emulation of, um, we'd probably see the biggest difference in that kind of workload compared to like an RPD one, which just has log entries going to OMAP and probably doesn't matter. Uh, right. I also I also really want to highlight this isn't just a performance issue, right? I mean, in the tests I ran, you look at the the difference in the amount of data flushed. This is an issue with how much wear we're causing on SSDs. I mean, in one in a one hour test, it went from like 16 gigabytes flushed to eight gigabytes flushed. That's that's like half the amount of data. Yeah. How many hours did you say? It was like a, each one was a one hour test. Yeah, a I mean, write test, very like, heavy write test. Yeah, I mean it's it's a factor too. Yes, but like these devices are like how many drive writes per day or whatever, <laughs> like the, oh. the enterprise devices. Um, you know, between like three and ten. Right. So sixteen gigs, eight gigs times twenty four. It's like three hundred gigs or something. And uh, if you're sharing that so. device between multiple OSTs for the same EU yeah, yeah. It's not insubstantial. I mean, if it's a yeah. even a 20% difference in terms of like driveware, that's, I don't know. Yep. Yeah. I'm just saying that if, I think we need more information to know whether this is something that we should address in Blue Store. Because the, that amplification behavior is going to be different with store and so if it doesn't make that much of a difference and we're targeting something different anyway then like i'm not sure it's a useful tangent but it's hard to say without knowing 
if it's actually going to make it faster or not, or, and by how much. So let's do that next, and then we can discuss it next week. Well, from the from the mailing list discussion, it sounded like Lisa was already excited to go off and prototype this. So yeah, okay, uh, that's that's good too. In parallel, we can find out how much the theoretical gain is too. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. did you want to talk a bit more about the creating PGs uh, post that you started on the mailing list? Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. I just had some questions, I guess. Um, so if we did have go with like option D, which is essentially creating one PG and then splitting it out um, however many times, um, there's no reason that we can't like throttle it as much as we want to, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, just have those splits go as slowly as possible. Yeah, I think it's just a trade-off because um, in the sort of the old current code, um, you basically can't write to the PG until you can't write to the whole pool until all the PGs are correct created. You just, right. It's like a diode just blocks. Whereas with this new behavior. Um, you would be able to write to the pre-split PGs immediately, and then that data mm -hmm. would get moved. Um, I mean, we could set up like a flag on the pool and just like block IO if we want to just emulate the same behavior. So I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. too worried about that um, until we reach the initial PG count. Right. Um, that would be possible, but I think in the in reality, it don't think it really matters. <laughs> um, it's, it, I'm not sure I, I guess. I'm guessing it would only come up in like a benchmark case where someone creates a pool and immediately tries running a benchmark on right. it. And then it, and only a big pool will matter where you're like your, your fire hose of IOs racing with the, with the, with the initial splits and only for right. big ones. Yeah. So I think it's a kind of a whatever. But it basically means that, um, we can make sure that the PG is successfully created. Um, before PG num changes, which means that all these race conditions in the OSD won't won't have to be considered. Mm -hmm. I have to check. I think there. I have to make sure that we can't reach the same race condition with the uh, um, with a peering message from another OSD that would trigger an OSD. A PG create, um, but that's easier um, to deal with um, because the, the those messages expire at an interval change, and the mon create ones don't. That's sort of the annoying difference, and why option B would make sense. Right. Um, right. So. Anyway, I don't think it's actually that hard to change to make um, the merge branch already is adding like a PG num type field that there are only a couple places at the bottom where we actually set those values. Um, mm -hmm. like create a pool and then would like set PG num and get PG num and some of the PGP num comparisons. Not even those ones yet. Um, so the only less sort of tricky bit is that the um, needs to decide where the where the thing that that actually changes it is whether that's something that sits in the manager or the monitor or the monitor. I think the manager makes more sense because it can be assimilated with the, the auto-tuning stuff that John is doing. But it actually feels like this is, is one layer down from that where the the stuff that John's working on will make sort of the like the policy decision of what we want it to be. Yeah, this is the and learning task and that's implementing it. And, and this will set the target and this will be the thing that actually does the stepping. Right. Um, to make it so. Yeah, that still seems like the kind of thing that the manager should be able to do, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's very similar to the other ideas we've had with for it, with like um, gradually increasing OSD weights or um, right. moving PGs around it otherwise. Yeah. I think I need to talk to John and find out 
where he was implementing this, if he was putting it in Python or in the some of the C code or mm -hmm. but to make sure that makes it squares what he's doing. Um, okay. I think in principle it would be a net improvement for big clusters though, because you don't have the monitor like linearly walking through sixty thousand PGs to create. Right. Instead the OSDs are you know the PG creates are distributed. By power by two and they're distributed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not that we that matters that much. <laughs> but whatever. I'm not convinced that power of two would be a good good plan for large pools. Yeah. Seems like the small limit might make more sense. Yeah, Just to, or like you know, or ten percent in a small percentage or something, so it's always a Yeah, yeah. Small per OSD change. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Works for me. Blue store cash balancing. Sure. So I think the plan right now is to kind of take what we've got and assign memory to RocksDB's high priority uh, cache, which unfortunately means only using RocksDB's LRU cache. Uh, this also requires some changes in RocksDB itself. But then after that, we basically allow memory to be set up to the ratios uh, that are assigned for each of the different kind of caches we have. So the the O node cache and buffer cache, and you know potentially other things. Um, but then if something doesn't need though that memory, if if one of those caches says, hey, I don't even need this much, you know, there aren't that many O nodes or whatever then it can be assigned to one of the other things. Um, this was, I think, more or less your idea, Sage, right? I mean, that's kind of what I think we, we were getting at when we finished that meeting yesterday. Sorry, I'm yeah. not sure Yeah, I'm just I'm reading in memory. So this is the first three bullet points here that we're talking yep. about, that's good, right? So, um, Right, so that there's a min associated with metadata, data RocksDB, and then um, and then it looks at what RocksDB thinks it needs to get all of its buffering um, filters and indexes. Um, yeah, the, and the size of the high priority. The next, that's the next chunk, and then any memory left over, we distribute proportionally based on whatever you configure. Um, but, unless, but, but... right, unless um, unless one of the caches is underutilized, like if if, if we say 50-50 and so the blue star cache has 500 megs and it's only using 100 megs and doesn't seem to want any more, then we can give it a 400 or maybe 300 of it to RocksDB until it looks like blue star is actually trying to use what it is due. Yep. So so what I want to do is implement that exactly that as kind of the first step. But then what I want to do is make that step right there, that, that last piece that we just talked about, repeatable for different tiers of memory. So the idea would then be that you, you do that step for high priority things in all of the caches. Um, maybe it's O nodes first, O map second, data third, but you're looking at maybe only uh, the last five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever we decide. Um, cache data and then we repeat that exact step again for you know low priority or maybe even we say medium priority and low priority but the idea being that we we want to say that data that has been cached in the last five minutes or, or whatever is more important than an o node that hasn't been accessed for a month let's say mm -hmm. but O nodes that have been accessed in the last five minutes are more important than data that's been accessed in the last five minutes. 
So I think what we can do is take that kind of simple scheme that we, we talked about and really extend it to kind of be happen at, with different tiers of data. As long as we can ask the caches, you know, how big is this portion of the LRU? You know, data that, that's, that's only five minutes old. I don't want to implement that with timestamps because I think that's too much overhead in the cache, but I think we can do it in a couple of different ways by either segmenting the LRU and, and kind of moving stuff between segments or um, possibly inserting markers into the LRU and doing kind of some smarts with trim uh, kind of to where the markers are, both with like static timestamp markers and then moving priority markers around kind of based on where those timestamps are. Why do you think the timestamps are high overhead? Just because get time of day is slow? Oh, yeah, get time of day. And then also we need to insert those into the O nodes, right? Because we an O node ref is yeah. just a, yeah. I mean, we can use the monotonic CPU clock or monotonic, right? Isn't there a clock that's not very high precision, isn't necessarily perfect across CPUs, but it's mostly accurate and it's and we don't need uh, high precision here. We're talking like minutes or seconds. You, uh, the real-time course clock can be serialized and shared between machines. The monotonic clock um, won't work between reboots is the big thing. So you don't want to serialize oh, it anymore. That's but fine. Like, so the monotonic course, clock should be fine, I think, in this case. Yeah. Yeah, the course real-time. Yeah. But if it's in memory, course monotonic should do fine. Or if you don't even care about cross-CPU, you can just grab the TSC. I think cross CPU we need, um, although it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be accurate. So okay. like course is fine. Yeah, so just do course real time and you'll be fine. Okay. Do we do we actually want to add do we want to add that to the the O node? I guess is the question. Like a, you it, know, it's like last... it's a sixty four bit value, right? I don't have like sure. um, I don't think it matters. Right. Yeah, we don't have to serialize it, right? Into yeah. into RocksDB, it can just be a local thing yeah. inside of it. I mean, if you're if you start talking about this other stuff where you have like new lists and vectors or whatever, you're adding pointers all over the place. So this is like no worse than that. Oh, I don't. Well, maybe it's it's moderately more. I don't know. I don't think you would have a whole lot of extra overhead with it, but maybe it'd be worse than the timestamps. I don't know. I mean, so if you had, say, like a vector of of intrusive lists, do you actually think that iterating through that vector of smaller intrusive lists rather than one bigger one would really be uh, dramatically more expensive? I guess not. I mean, if it's, yeah, you we, wouldn't add a member per, oh, no, so. It just sounds like a lot of work when you can just set a timestamp. Sure. Well, yeah, we can try the timestamp. I mean, it'd be easy to add, right? And then yeah. you're just... Um, the only thing that with like the marker scheme I was thinking is right now the, the iterator two is constant time, if I understand correctly, the way that they, they do that. Uh -huh. So if you can iterator two a marker, you can just get it rather than searching through timestamps to find kind of when something was yeah it, it seems like the question is can you get away with just looking at the end of the cache and how old it is and is that enough information to make a, a step or do you need to know like at 75 percent position what is the timestamp, or can you just know what the oldest is like, can you make it so that it's sort of like a it you, walks towards a better solution or whatever it, it seems to me the 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 thing you really need here is to be able to say, um, okay, anything that's within a certain time span, you know, really roughly is high priority. So can we can we do that with low overhead using timestamps? Oh, I see. Yeah, I think this doesn't necessarily. Um... Looking at the tail doesn't fit into the idea of um, thinking in terms of like tiers of priority, high priority and then low priority. Um, but it might be enough 
just to say that, you know, the oldest O node is two days old and the oldest thing in RocksDB is like, um, whatever, two hours old. <laughs> and so <laughs> therefore maybe you should get more memory to RocksDB. They're, they're going to be almost the same though, right? I mean, because you're going to be constantly, well, I mean, if you're, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah. I'm still not completely convinced that um, we we know what we should do. Say say that say the oldest RocksDB data is two hours old and the oldest O node is two days old. Well, that one seems kind of obvious. But if it's the other way around, like mm -hmm. does that necessarily mean that we want to devote more cache to O nodes and not to RocksDB? Or maybe it's like two hours and four hours. Like does that mean that we can make should make a change? Because the the, yeah. Are you going to get the best performance by I guess uh, it's, my, it's my very like complicated system. My, my very coarse grained look at this right now is that I assume that a lot of people are probably going to have just idle data, right? On their cluster that we don't care about. So really mm -hmm. the the thing I, I'm kind of right now more interested in is not devoting like cash to the cold. Uh, yeah to cold o nodes and instead letting that free up to for for data it kind of feels like just looking at the end of the caches would be enough in that case and then just trimming back to to some like once they vary by like power of two or a power of four or something, then just start like pushing, pushing memory the other way. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to think about it more and kind of try to play out what the behavior would look like in my head. But I mean, well, Anyway, this is, yeah, this is kind of um, this isn't very exciting, but my feeling is still that we're going to get like 95% of the benefit from the step one that you just described. Um, and sort of optimizing for this last little bit is. We could we could spin our wheels for a long time trying to get that last little bit of like best utilizing the memory and I'm not sure that it's how important it's going to be. It it seems to me that we see really dramatically different behavior depending on if we prioritize O nodes versus O map for different kinds of workloads. Like RBD really benefits by making sure that O nodes are are heavily cached, whereas RGW really benefits from making sure that O map is heavily cached. That was kind of yeah. one of the reasons why I was kind of thinking, you know, this something like this where we have kind of differing views of high priority and low priority might might help us yeah i did a, i feel like i did a back of the envelope calculation i can't remember what it what it was for omap like how many if you had if you had a 10 terabyte ssd that is full of big omap rgw objects how many objects would it actually be and i think it was something like I can't remember what it was. I have to redo the calculation. But um, my recollection was that it was something that would is not that much. Like they would all fit. You could put all of them in the anode cache. In which case, um, the the piece in step one where we we see that we're like not using all the memory and we just sort of give the slack to the other to RockCV would capture it. Okay. Well, let's try that first. Let's run some tests on it and just see see what we see. Maybe that will be enough. Hope so. <laughs> but but yeah, if not, then the, the time thing seems like a, a simplish thing. We would have to add RocksDB also have it tag things in its cache by time also so we can compare Apple to Apple, right? I think that we can maybe, with RocksDB, we could maybe just start out with their high, low priority concept and kind of say that, it's you know generally more important to to give rocks db cache but I, I don't know maybe not
We could. We could do. I mean, it would be it wouldn't be that hard, right? And maybe that would be worth doing too. I would feel more comfortable knowing that we're comparing the same thing between the two than like yeah. some nebulous notion of high and low priority in one case and like our own nebulous definition of high and low priority in another case. Sure. Just keeping it consistent throughout. Yeah. But anyway, it seems like first things first. RocksDB also has this kind of other separate issue where the block cache memory spikes up during compaction. And we almost might have to treat that differently because giving RocksDB more cache might help with that kind of odd scenario that we don't deal with in our other caches. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a special case, I guess. Also, when you in RocksDB, when you exceed the the soft cap on the block cache in general, it right now drains the entire high priority cache. Like it flushes the whole thing out and then starts over from the beginning. I don't know why it does that. That's weird. Yeah. You seem like questions to talk to a RocksDB developer about understand why they did that. <laughs> And then how that relates to what we were trying to do. There, there was a sort Fire of a dis reason. yeah. There's sort of a discussion of it from the the post I made on the the Facebook group, but um, it, I, I I don't know. I I'm not sure. Well, take a look at it and see what you think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else we should talk about? Uh, one thing: uh, the size of uh, the buff, the size of uh, allocations for disk allocations for BlueFS. At the moment, uh, it's uh, one meg. Uh, in the pull request related to uh, to uh, Jumbo pages. Uh, there is increment uh, to two max. It's only because uh, those uh, two max is the default value. It's typical value of a huge page. Is it okay? Is the increment okay, or we will need to introduce some extra complexity, basically very very thin uh, complexity, uh, to divide one huge page into two so one meg buffer? Where did the one meg number come from? Uh, f let me uh, let me link the pull request. There is a, it's a config uh, it's a config value. It's a default from our options CC. It sounds like something that we pulled out of a hat. Okay. Here's. Uh, the link. BlueFS Alex size is default to one meg. Yeah, yep. I, I just made that up. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> it can be anything. Cool. It would make uh, changing to two max just makes uh, things easier. Uh, things easier. We don't need to divide uh, a huge page. It does. Um, it does mean this is basically min alex bluefs also yeah it means that well if bluefs is writing a small file it will waste more space but i think that is pretty rare cuz the ssd files right now are like <laughs> over 100 megs i think or many tens <laughs> of megs so like <laughs> there are only a handful of small files in reality like what about the related things one. for BlueFS, the like min log runway and max prefresh? Does matter? That's also what I'm right now. Uh, yeah, I mean those could change too. I don't think they've. They might as well be the same, but it, it doesn't really matter because they're all on the read side. I think. Yeah. Uh, the alternative uh, could be uh, to not uh, to reuse the same buffer to use buffers in uh, in um, file writer 
because the most uh, the most benefit uh, in the in the PR comes from avoiding uh, extensive calls to uh, to a page fault handler. Uh, we are allocating mm -hmm. file, file writer allocates uh, a new yeah. huge buffer each time. The, by default, the buffer is consistent with uh, default sized uh, pages. Uh, however, when you the the, uh, the kernel is lazy, it's uh, when you when you are doing allocation, it's quite uh, it's quite probable it's quite probable you will get uh, you won't get. You, the, the buffer won't be populated with uh, with frames, with pages. All you are getting uh, is just address space, nothing more. Uh, the actual the actual um, uh, filling the address space with uh, frames uh, is caused by first write to a given uh, uh -huh. memory region. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is this a measurable so basically, difference? Then? Yep, uh, around five percent. Oh, awesome! In profiling on my local machine, uh, that is uh, that is quite slow. I I I I, I know that Adam uh, Kupczyk was uh, profiling on Inserta, and uh, it was a bit uh, a bit higher, even. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it probably even doesn't matter that much if this perfectly. I mean, it should match, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't perfectly match the page size, the huge table, huge page size, because there aren't that many files that BlueFS has open at a time. And so even if you wasted one meg for each open file, it's like not, not that much. But might as well make a, might as well make a match. So. Sounds good to me. OK, I will, uh, I will uh, clean up uh, the patent uh, and send uh, it's, uh, it, the, the, refer the uh, clean up the clean version soon. Cool. Cool. OK. Sounds good. Um, uh, however, uh, do we expect that our users already uh, already empl employ uh, uh, large pages? What do you mean by users already employ them? Uh, Linux offers uh, two tastes of uh, of Jumbo pages. First one is some is the well known explicit. Uh, Huge page mechanism when uh, the operator is obliged to pre-allocate to to set the number of uh, of huge pages that kernel takes uh, from uh, t takes to form the pool of uh, huge pages available. Second mechanism is the, is transparent huge huge pages uh, that is best effort actually. Mm -hmm. There is no guarantee you are, you, you are getting the uh, the large page. However, it doesn't require any uh, configuration, any tuning of uh, sys controls. It's simply much easier to use. Mm -hmm. I also tried to just set, just increase the 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 size of min alloc to, to max, uh, hopefully to get uh, the automata working on. Uh, okay, it was working, but uh, it's still uh, less efficient than the explicit mechanism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a good sense of whether other processes on the machine will be using these or not. Certainly, with C star, we'll use yeah, them. That's the... Okay, that makes uh, things uh, completely different. Okay. All right. Uh, I, the last thing, this is quick. There's um, a few recent pull requests to, towards the buffer list, um, making buffer list use a vector instead of a list. The first one just cleans up all the push front stuff so that a, um, a buffer list would actually, or a vector implementation would, would behave. Um, that's relatively simple and non-trivial. I think the, the bigger issue, which is the one that you're working on, Radic, I believe, is that um, there are cases where we have an iterator on a buffer list and we append a buffer list, and so the iterator yep. can get invalidated. 
how's that how's that coming hopefully this looks uh, like resolved i've tuned uh, the iterator buffer list uh, iterator uh, to not require uh, validity of iterators actually it it uh, it recal recalculates the position each time which is pretty pretty cheap because uh, we we switch, we switch to uh, to small vector to a continuous memory, so it's just a, of, uh, it's a matter of of uh, easy math. Some some modifications, to, some additions. You have to look at each item in front of you in the vector, though, right, and add like it's still an order in operation. Uh, let me let me provide a link. It seems like you'd still want to have the the epic thing that you were talking about, where your iterator is versioned, and so you're sort of invalidating it. No, uh, I I decided to go another way uh, without okay. versioning, without uh, branches. Just uh, uh, we are we are already we are storing uh, pointer to uh, to container in buffer in uh, in buffer iterator. Instead mm -hmm. of uh, instead of carrying uh, the iterator to list. I switch to uh, to carrying current index. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, let me provide link to the branch. One second, please. Just curious, kind of related to this, do we have data about how many buffers are typically in a buffer list? What the distribution is? I don't think so. My sense is that it's probably less than eight ninety nine point nine percent of the time, which is why mm -hmm. the small vector thing is attractive. But I'm certain that there are outliers that have a yep. billion to this, so. I tried to I tried to have uh, four slots and one slot in a, in a small vector. Uh, the having only one. The single uh, seems to uh, to uh, to get more the most benefit. Oh, I see. Instead of it's oh, it's the index into the vector, not the end. I was thinking it was index into the the logical buffer. That makes sense. Okay. So if the vector reallocates, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yep. That makes a lot more sense. Okay. That sounds good. It's stable enough uh, to conduct uh, initial testing. Uh, I've got um, something between uh, two uh, and two and uh, three percent on my on my, on my development machine. Uh, tests on uh, inserta are ongoing. Cool. Cool. Okay. And what value did you pick for small vector for? One. Like. One initially, and then you switch it to four here. Uh, nope, uh, four was uh, was uh, initially. Then I oh. switched to std vector just for testing. Then I switched to uh, back. I switched back to a uh, small vector, but with one uh, with pre-allocated uh, space for exactly one uh, one um, okay. uh, buffer PTR. Okay. I would expect that something a small integer would make more sense, but we should, yeah, I'll test it and see what what you actually see. Because the cost of allocating space for four pointers instead of one pointer is like zero, right? Uh, we are not allocating pointers uh, anymore. We are allocating, uh, oh, sorry, PTRs, which means buffer pointers, which is 16 uh, uh, bytes long. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's some kind of compromise uh, between uh, memory indirections and memory and cache density. Right. Okay. Yeah. So ideally, you would get it to fit into like one or two cache lines. Ideally, one cache line, but there's a ton of random stuff in list that probably will make it hard to fit into one cache line. But maybe we could remove some of it. Like the, I don't know if the pointer cache is in there. Remember. A vector, a length, a mem copy count, which we could probably get rid of. 
that's for profiling and the append buffer. I guess that's it. So it's, it's actually pretty lean. Right? Uh, Is that right, Radek? I mean, we basically, if we look at, it's, right now it looks like it just has those four members. So as long as we tune mean, the uh, size of the thing to fit in one cache line. We could. Do, but do you mean, uh, do you mean the buffer list uh, itself, not uh, the pointer? Yeah, the, buff, the buffer list itself, yeah. Okay. Taking a look. Buffer, still, and PTR. Ah, uh, mem copy count. Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's uh, four bytes. So even if we kill it, most likely because of alignment, uh, there will be no difference. Yeah. But still, yeah. if pointer is 16 bytes, uh, it really depends on what the small vector overhead is. But we could probably fit at least like two or three of them. I guess uh, that small vector is uh, is just a regular uh, boost container vector plus uh, the internal space. I don't. Yeah. I haven't checked the size of containers vector, but the STD vector on my machine is uh, 24 bytes exactly. Okay. Which is pretty surprising. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know uh, what is uh, the 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 extra member. Definitely size T plus pointer plus I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, in any case, um, it, the, the cache line is 128 bytes, right? Or is it 64? No, 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 no. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty complicated. At the level of uh, L1 and and L2 on x86 uh, typical uh, stuff, it's uh, 64 bytes. However, if I recall correctly, the transactions uh, to main memory are are uh, are issued in uh, in two cache lines. So 128. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, what is also interesting uh, is the is I can see. Uh, a lot of cycles spent on the trampoline uh, in in PLT. That, uh, in, in trampolines for uh, functions of related to buffer lists. It's uh, because we are. Uh, it's as, I guess it's because uh, we are compiling uh, this, our our stuff with FPIC, uh, which means that all all calls needs to go uh, through PLT. So I I I want I would like to try uh, I would like to give a try to inlining to aggressive inlining some uh, and moving uh, some stuff from uh, CC to uh, to the header. In pro in profiling in perf I can see that we are that this that the things that the PLT trampolines related to, sorry to a buffer list. It uh, consumes around five, around a half percent of uh, of cycles. Not much, however, it's it's really it's really it's really thin thing. And uh, I guess the most uh, more important would be that the compiler uh, uh, is not able at the moment to uh, to make some optimizations, like yeah, eradicate uh, repeated code and something like that. It seems like that the trade-off is that if it's in line, then you have a longer um, instruction sequence or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm. I'm thinking more. I think the buffer stuff, getting that cleaned up, sounds more exciting to me. <laughs> but. Um, Yep, it's a uh, it's that's a hard, single hard. piece, and uh, we can where we can squeeze uh, relatively uh, relatively a uh, large number of cycles. Yep. Without the need to touch everything in the project. 
Yep. Sounds good. All right. I think we're out of time. Anything else? All right. Sage, only that if you have a second to look over and try to help figure out this uh, this CRC mismatch error, I'd appreciate um, it. I have a I have another call, um, but if you can um, if you can give it a shot reproducing with UFS twenty, or is that maybe we'll get lucky and it'll happen quickly? <laughs> maybe. <I don't> know. <laughs> it's it feels inefficient phishing for like individually individually enabling log lines because it's yeah I don't have a, it, a great hunch as far as where this is right now. It's really weird. It goes in streaks. I I get like three errors in a row in three runs, and then I go through like another five without hitting it once. <laughs> it's bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I can All try. Right. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think the trick is that um, ideally we need the history, the historical log, not the 120, but just 20, which okay. means that it's a disk space issue also. Man, yeah, I don't know. That's going to be rough. How? Um, or you could try level 10. We... That's probably. Yeah, level 10 should be, a... be enough, actually. Level 10 with the added logging that you put in, or level 10 prior level 10 to will, that? Level 10 should capture pretty much everything I added. Um, but you could leave it in. You, I, it wasn't what I thought, so. <laughs> OK. Um, the only reason I ask is because the stuff you added in does add a substantially large amount of uh, logging to, to 10. Yeah. Yeah. That will... yeah. OK. OK. Let's try it. Sounds good. Great. See you guys. See ya. See you. Bye.